maybe we could uh, hold the time. And then I introduce to you the speaker, the last speaker of this session, Saskia Sassen, who is at this time Robert Lynn Professor of Sociology at Columbia University in New York and also Centennial Visiting Professor at the London School of Economics. Uh, her uh, research focuses on analyzing globalization and international human migration. But I also pleased to mention that she has a honorary degree from Delft University, which maybe has something to do with her Dutch roots. I get the floor. Well, thank um, you very much for mentioning that. Delft was my first honoris causa. And since then, it's been a sort of growth industry. So I think that uh, I'm really grateful to Delft for that. Um, well, what I want to talk about is, uh, is a bit different. I'm not a lawyer, and I don't work on the law. Um, I'm interested, or well, what I will focus on here, is a series of formations, development, conditions, dynamics that constitute themselves as a global condition, but do so in ways that do not necessarily uh, uh, imply the law. You know, there is no legalizing. However, there is a use of the law, and there is, and this is what I care a lot about in my work, an invading of norms that belong to a domain that might be very private, as I find them, but in installing or in invading of national law with those norms that belong to that other domain, which then get dressed as if they were public norms. So it, it's sort of a, I'm going to, you know, I'm a social scientist, so I'm going to show you a bit of data, and this, I can help that um, data talk to me. I, am, I hope they talk a bit to you as well. So I want to focus on, on sort of a variety of cases. I should start by saying that I, uh, when I'm, I'm in the middle of a project right now, which basically has to do about what happens when territory, understood, who's speaking about territory, you read, as complex, you spoke about territoriality, complex category exits existing formal frame. So um, I, I consider global high finance one of them, but I also look at other domains. Now, to do the kind of work that I do, and at this stage I'm in the middle of, there is no conclusion, there is no elegant cadence here at the end, I, I sort of, um, I have to remove myself a bit from the domain of method. Method, you understand, for a social scientist is pretty important. So I have invented a comfort zone for myself, a kind of anti-chamber to method. And I need to just lay down three little items before I move into the substance of the subject to illustrate how I proceed. I'm one of the social scientists who is not interested in replications, but I actually want to look at a domain that one might say is a bit savage, wild, undisciplined in the sense of disciplines, and then try to make sense of it. Method does not, existing methods don't help because they are too disciplined. Eventually I get to method. So I call these analytic tactics or tactical analysis, you know, whatever. But I, I, the tactical is, is critical because it means that I want to be highly mobile, conceptually, theoretically, and empirically. Those are freedoms which, by the time you get to the final stage of the project, you can no longer take. So the first point here is I emphasize the making of conditions, not functions of, not finance is not a function of, global firms are not a function of, they are made. And making for me is also the making of justice, the making of injustice, the making of law, the unmaking of law, I guess, as well. So this question of making does bring up a series of issues that, that might not come up when you are doing a, you know, a different kind of analysis. Then, second point, actively destabilizing stable meanings. So I am actively destabilizing the notion of territory. I'm actively destabilizing all kinds of sort of almost foundational terms. And um, I think that you know, no meaning is permanently stable. But meanings acquire a certain kind of stability 
if you want to, in the Keynesian epoch in the West, the social, family, immigration, the state, that they, they had sort of stabilized meanings. Many of these are now unstable. And when they are not, I try to actively destabilize. And you will see, when I get into my cases, it will. And then, third point here, in the shadow of powerful explanations. And here, what I'm trying to say is that, confronted with a powerful explanation, and a powerful explanation is to be taken seriously. They're collectively produced. You know, it's not just any explanation. There are good reasons why they're so powerful. So you can't just throw them out the window. What I do is, my first move, if you want, is to ask, what does it obscure precisely because it is so powerful? So I don't reject the power of it, but I want to know what it obscures. If it is an explanation, inevitably it has eliminated all kinds of things that could be part of the empirics of it. And then finally, I might get to that or not, this question of when territory exits conventional framings. And my argument there is that we're seeing uh, the making of a variety of informal jurisdictions. I think global finance has made an informal, partly formal and partly informal jurisdiction for itself. Land grants, 220 million hectares in the last five years, bought by foreign buyers. Hedge funds, the main buyers, not China. In the last two years, hedge funds have become the main buyers of land, not because they're about to become farmers. That is not uh, the case. So anyhow, so I'm looking at a series of cases like that. Now, ah, I want to illustrate, I want to illustrate an analytic tactic by looking at one particular case. It just has nothing to do with the stuff as such, but it is really a brief and dramatic illustration of an analytic tactic. Take the term remit, little word, remittances, slightly bigger word, but still basically a little word. It has become a category, chock full of meaning. It's one of those where confronted with what does it tell me, I want to know what it obscures. And so usually when it means by now uh, money sent by poor immigrants who come to rich countries and then send their money back home, that is the full meaning that it has. And it is a certain kind of perspective. You look at it all from the perspective of your country. Most immigrants will be from lower income countries, so you're looking at what are those low income countries. In the United States, Mexico, Philippines, Dominican Republic, Ecuador, etc. If you're in Germany, it's another set of countries. If you're in it's another set of countries. My little analytic tactic, I took a little sideways step and I changed the question just a bit. It's still a cognate of that established question. I asked, who are the main remittance recipient countries? Rather than asking where the most of the remittances of my country go to. So what you get when you put it that way is that in the top 10 uh, remittance receiving countries in the world, in other words, it's a global perspective, there are five rich countries and two, India and China, who are bimodal. It sort of unsettles the image that we have, and adorably, I find this, in the top 20, there is also the United States as a leading remittance country. But there was in our countries where often the notion is these immigrants, they come here, they work here, and then they send the money back home. Well, if you switch it just a bit, you get another picture. Now, as I already said, this is just an illustration to suggest how you take a global perspective where before you take a state-centric perspective, and there is sort of another outcome. Very little step, sideways step, but it gets a different result. So, I'm now going to talk about, um, first, what crosses borders and is constitutive uh, of something that we might call global, etc. And then I'm going to talk about what does not cross borders, but is also constitutive. And here again, it's this, this transversal point of entry into the, the study. So, so the first issue, and this comes back this morning, I can't remember who said it, but uh, who made a critique and saying that the analysis, I think Emilio, Emilio, maybe you were, that the analysis that Günther has sort of evicts the state. Maybe it wasn't you, I don't know. But you know, the state is out. Actually, in my analysis, I find that the state is continuously used by, but against its own original norm, if you want, or normativity. 
So in the case of finance, finance uses the state. The neoliberal project, if you want, or its particular norms, privileging uh, control of inflation over job growth. For most countries in the world, in the 1980s and early 1990s, that represented a 380, no, it can be that, 180 degree change, total transformation in their policy. And this was the norm that finance needed in order to have a global market. A global capital market is different from an international capital market. And this is just one example. There are a whole variety of norms that come from private actors that install themselves or are installed in national law, where they are dressed in the clothes of public national law, and, and they actually contain that norm that is a piece of the global. I don't know if I'm communicating here. And another version, a very different type of instance, uh, is the fact uh, what we call very loosely the global firm. There is no such uh, persona, legal persona, as a global firm. There are, however, by now almost 400,000 firms that conduct themselves as if they were global and that have the guarantees of contract um, and other such you know, things that firms need uh, that give in, in all, in most countries of the world that are signatories to a variety of treaties. Now, what I'm interested in recovering here is how is that very specialized, multi-sided, operational space of global firms constructed? Well, it is constructed by using the often extremely different national instruments that countries around the world have to give guarantees of contract, you know, property issues, etc., to these foreign firms. So what I see there is using the particularities of national law, very, very different in just about all countries from each other to secure this space for global firms in order to produce a fairly standardized operational space out of a diversity of national instruments. In some cases, it's the courts, it can be an administrative rule, a whole variety of, uh, of different actors. Of different instruments, and so this, this, so, and, and I mentioned this now. This is a footnote because there's a lot of talk always when you enter a discussion of the global that globalization represents a homogenizing, and often that is because the observation stays at a certain level. So in this case, you have indeed a fairly homogenized operational space for these firms, but they are constructed through an enormous diversity of national instrumentalities. It is done differently in Germany, and of course in Europe you have a European law, but the United States is different from the Philippines, it's different from Indonesia, it's different from China, etc., etc. And all these countries have given foreign firms certain guarantees. And so I, I talk about an operational space. Now, I hope that is all clear. So I want to quickly get into the story of finance, because I think that, um, that, as you saw here, uh, you know, um, a constitutive actor, in the first one, you know, I'm interested in these, in, in these kinds of spaces, if you want, but I'm also interested in who's the social force, because that's the part of the making. This stuff is not just a function of, it is made. And so finance is a critical maker, so I will talk, but I'm just going to focus on finance now. And I want to just, finance is a capability, finance is highly misunderstood. I'm always horrified at how people, including economists, I mean, you have financial economists, they don't make that, but many economists make that mistake. Finance is not about money. Finance is a capability. The power and the creativity of finance comes from its difference with traditional banks. Traditional banks sell money, to put it simply, huh? they have. Finance sells money, so to speak, that it does not have. In that not having lies its incredible creativity, all these talented, you know, classes, etc., term I detest, and also lies, and this is the key point, its need to invade other sectors. So when I say that finance is a critical constitutive force of this particular global 
era, there have been other global eras. It is, it's a function party, if you want, or it's the consequence of finance having to invite other, invade other sectors. Now, to get to this creativity of finance, and this also happens to be the thing that I want to briefly discuss, that if you want catapulted the system into crises, officially speaking, so to, so to say, in, in September of 2008, though the first alarm clocks went off in August 2007. Now, here is credit, can people hear me? My voice, I'm not so, I'm a bit ill, but. Um, so this is 201, a value of 919 billion. I know that this thing with billions and trillions, but you know, it's a lot of zeros at any rate. <laughs> um, and so it grew up to 207 to 62 trillion. Now, I'm sure you all know this, but just to remind you, at that same year, the, global va the value of global GDP was 54 trillion. Uh, so it grew more. That is not unusual for finance, by the way, precisely because finance is not about money. We, we measure it, we monetize it, but it's something else. Now, here is a, also this, this picture also captures this, this, this uh, image, captures um, something about finance and its sort of continuous crisis. So it represents, on the one hand, those who believe that this system was in trouble and was not going to have much more of a long sort of role, if you want, and others who saw in that a business opportunity. You know, finance is, there's a lot of uh, issues of belief and confidence, etc., in finance. And so they created an instrument that was like an insurance. It just was not an insurance. And it was called credit default swap. It was a derivative, basically. And so what happens in August 2007, alarms rang, uh, alarm bells ring all over the world among the big banks. Bank of China, Paris Bar, you mentioned it. And so the things are getting heating up. So by 2008, in, in September, of almost everybody who had bought these credit default swaps says, okay, I'm cashing in my insurance, things are not going well. But of course these firms did not have the money because it was a derivative. It was not insurance. Insurance means you know you have your money. So this brings down the system. Now mind you, the system is 630 trillion. Financial value, you know, that you know, so that one say assets, it's a debt. So that is 14 and a half times global GDP. But this was enough to create a serious crisis. And so I, I will say this little story in my class, I was telling them, they said, so 50 trillion asset were whoop, wiped off. That's like the equivalent of global GDP, including China. And my students asked, well, who got it? You have the, you know it, nobody got it. Um, now, making, look at this. You, you just take, this is a simplified version. Just assume that each of, this is United States, this is Europe, this is Asia. Assume that this captures well, if this is March 2008, it's like right before, this is from IMF staff papers, not official reports. And so you can see the difference. Asia, almost nothing. This represents the deployment, if you want, of all kinds of financial instruments. US very high. You know who had the biggest surprise? Europe. And that's partly because a lot of American firms were operating in London, in Frankfurt, in Paris. Europeans were surprised at how high, how close they were. You know, again, there is much to be said about this, but I'm not. Now, I want to give you a microcosm, again, of finance and its invasive capabilities. And I want to talk very briefly about a particular instrument called, incorrectly, subprime mortgages. Subprime mortgages were invented in the 70s as a state project. The kind of distortion of the subprime mortgage that is invented in 201 is a financial project. As a state project, that was a mortgage that tried to help people get houses, modest income people get houses. The financial project had nothing to do with housing. And this captures something about finance. So what was left in the United States is about 70, 30% of households mostly modest, because 70% of the people in the United States already own their house, you know, this is 2000 that we're talking about. In a very short period of time, a brutal, short history that contained within it an extraordinary innovation, that story was finished. Now, what was the innovation? The innovation was, here is this enormous value, financial value floating around in the world, 
uh, the big investors say, give me some asset, material assets. What was left? Little houses. The innovation was, how do we separate the housing, the actual housing, how do we separate the mortgage payments on that very little value, etc., from some other complex instrument that contains the asset or a slice of the asset. I hope that people are with me still. Anyhow, that meant that literally they had to get, this, these are the figures that we know from the middle period, 500 contracts, it was all about contracts, the contract that said, this is an asset, right, the mortgage. It was not about whether these people paid their mortgage, it was not about the value of the house being mortgage. 500 contracts per, per financial actor firm, whatever it might have been, in the period of a week. Otherwise, it was not going to work. In a period of five years, they got 15 million contracts. You understand what we're talking about. This is finance in action. And they succeeded in delinking their problems from all these other issues. Whether they paid the mortgage or not, that didn't matter at all. This is very, I'm hoping that people are understanding. You know, this is it. Now, it took 14 in between steps to get that. Enormously talented uh, financiers inventing. And you know, the math of, of finance, high finance is the math of physicists, it's not the math of microeconomic models. It's basically algorithmic, it's open. In comes, out goes, etc. And Goldman Sachs, for instance, they have like a hundred physicists in the back room. So these are all, all, all these financial firms use physicists. Now it's true that physicists, after they turn 30, they really don't know what to do with themselves. So hey, there they are. And it's like, I don't know if people know that famous little book, The Back Room, where everything becomes a technical issue. It's not about, these physicists were not interested in destroying the economies of many countries, as finance did. It was just a technical issue. How do we produce this delinking? There is a lot of that in the current system. Now, one effect here was of these 15 million contracts is that 9 million people, 9 million households have lost their home. So quickly look at these figures. I don't want to develop. Foreclosure means you get a notice that you have to leave your house because you have not paid your mortgage or whatever. Now, one house can get more than one foreclosure, but we know for a fact that 9.2 million are out of their houses. Some of them went to 10 cities. We now have millions of people in 10 cities in the United States and in slum cities in the desert. Some went to poorer housing, etc. You know, but the system renders them invisible. So this is a short, brutal history that captures the talents that finance deploys. So when I was talking about inserting its normativity inside public national law in country after country after country, they can do that too. Now I wanted to just continuing on this. Here's what is happening right now. I was working on this three years ago, and I was seeing that, my God, Eastern Europe has become a, become a key. Is this the one that I have? Right. So, so just an example of what finance does and how it, you know, it operates incredibly locally. So take, this is the ratio of household credit to personal disposable income. In other words, what does credit always sound so good? Because you think buying, I can buy with this credit. It's a debt. So this is the relationship of debt, household debt, to household income. I take a nice country, like the Czech Republic, huh, here. In 2000, that was 8.5%. That's really good. In the United States, it was already 104%. In other words, more than household income. You understand what I'm talking about, right? Now then by just five years later, it was 27%. That's an amazing growth, you understand? Then Hungary. 11% in 2000, 39%. Now this is, now Hungary right now has a foreclosure crisis. I don't know if people know, more than one million households have lost their home. This, this is why I'm going to do Now compare, I'd like to compare Germany. Look at the stability. 70%, 70%, 70, 70, 70. The Germans are amazing. Stability of we to capture it. The United States went from 104 to 132, unstoppable. Italy, look how low. They, pay, they buy cash, and they have, of course, alternative banking. So that was uh, 25 to 34%, almost no business to be done. I asked myself, who owns this debt? I, this is the kind of research that I love doing. Well, this is the share of you know, a certain kind of debt, uh, foreign currency denominated household credit. Huh? That includes a whole mix of things. So in Hungary, 
40% is foreign owned debt. That is why it is now so subject. In Romania, it is even more, etc. So here you have, I have many of these tables. I don't want to. But who, who are the banks? Well, they are Austrian banks, they are Swiss banks, there are some American banks in there. Why does this matter? This matters because the locality loses all control, and this is one issue with finance also, loses all control over its own resources. One thing is you, if you pay your mortgage to a little local bank, that money recirculates in the locality. If you're paying it to a foreign bank, who is not even lo located in your country, my, you just lose it. So whatever the pooling of resources of a people, locality, I prefer saying, uh, you know, it sort of disappears. Now, the implications here, remember what I was saying, you know, that, that it, it, sure, it is global, but it constitutes, constitutes itself locally. All of this requires little changes in national law. It could be law, it could be administrative, you know, it's different. This thing, this is made. These outcomes are made. And so in that sense, for me, um, the state is very much present in there. But it is present in an odd way. It's not the expected way. How we theorize it is another matter. Now, here I want to briefly talk. I have a clock, right? Yes. So here, what does not cross borders, but is global, we have a real thing about uh, linking the global, globality and mobility. If you're immobile, you're not global, supposedly. Well, in fact, there are all kinds of globalities that are marked by kind of immobility. I think it is important, conceptually, to get away from this notion that the global, globality and mobility, across border mobility, are sort of, they need each other. I'm not so sure of that. Now, one, one, one issue that, that I do is one of my analytic tactics is to look, which I have been doing here as well, I have already been doing it, is to look at extreme cases with the assumption that they are heuristic. In their extremeness, they tell us something about a larger configuration than the thing itself. So here I look at the extreme, the globality, the potential globality of the immobile, the geographically immobile. In other words, really, civil, poor civil society actors. And uh, so the constitutive force is the geographically immobile engaged in civil society struggles. Now, I have looked with great care at organizations such as Amnesty International, Oxfam, etc. Let's just take Amnesty International as an example. Amnesty International is a highly cosmopolitan, etc. institution. What would it be without the non-cosmopolitan, immobile, obsessed people who are concerned with the torturer in their jail, the, the, the whatever, the firm that destroys you know, their water and causes death. What, you know, so I want to recover that other zone of those that are immobile, they are not crossing but are in fact constituting the globality. When you speak with these people, I also do this in, on the environment, you know, the rainforests, Central America, Indonesia, and, uh, and Brazil. They, they are, they, the, the difference now is some sort of notion of an internet or something, I don't know what it is. They're mostly not on internet, by the way. But, but some notion that I'm not alone, because they're pretty, they're non-cosmopolitan and obsessed and very local and they are constituting a globality. I tend to say about financiers that they are uh, non-cosmopolitan, obsessive. The local doesn't count, but you know, they are global. I mean, they're not cosmopolitan. What makes them cosmopolitan is, uh, what makes them global is not a cosmopolitan tendency. Now, um, so, so the, 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 the result is a kind of globality constituted through multi-sided immobile actors. Now again, these are extremes. Finance and global civil society are two extremes. Two more points I want to add. One is this notion that we're moving towards a borderless world. Yes, some sectors are very mobile across borders, certainly finance, etc., uh, etc. Et but I also think that part of the story that is happening here is the making of new bordering capabilities that are producing transversal bordered spaces that you are in, you are either in or you're out. No trafficker can take you across those borders. And 
this has gone, I would say, a bit beneath the radar screen. And so one of my hypotheses, it's still a hypothesis, is that the more we, that, that well, well, if you want this deregulating of many borders vis-a-vis -vis the flow of capital, of information, of, you know, specialized services, etc., that that is sort of, has produced these new bordered spaces, which leaves me thinking that we are as bordered as we used to be during, say, the Keynesian period, which had lots of protectionisms. Uh, it's just a different configuration. So I, I'm sort of interested, I, I don't know that I can establish that, but this is just a hypothesis. Is there a connection between the lifting of borders vis-a-vis -vis the flows of capital, vis-a-vis -vis the blah, et cetera, et cetera, and the making of these newly bordered spaces? Now, me, let me give you two examples. Most financial trading today happens in private circuits, not in the stock exchanges. I know all kinds of very distinguished banks on Wall Street that want to enter some of these major uh, investment networks, and they have been told no. There are a few brokers, a few big banks that are in charge of these, and this is a this is a global phenomenon. These are truly bordered spaces, and they're highly bordered. And and the other case was the other, oh the WTO. If employees, you know, there's a kind of global labor market information. If firms go through the WTO, uh, their employees have portable rights. They have a lot of rights. What they cannot do is run for office in the countries where they are, which they don't want to do either because that's not how they want to spend their time in the civic zone. But, but uh, uh, they, they, we have produced a subject that has formal portable rights you know, across countries. This is only the WTO signatory countries, but that's a lot of countries. And uh, I, I mention this because with immigrants, one of the issues always is, can we, get, can we recognize that they are citizens you know, from another country? And the notion is also, no, you cannot do rights without a connection to the national state. And it seems to me that though we have, I always say, ladies and gentlemen, we have produced a subject, a rights-bearing subject with portable rights across borders, really since the early 1990s. But again, these are things, formations that tend to go a bit beneath the um, the, the radar. <coughs> now, final point, and this comes to this question of territory. So, so land grabs, lots of land, etc. The usual explanation that you get from political economists is commodification of land, which is an absolutely adequate explanation. You, know, you can really say that. Now, I immediately want to ask, this is my analytic tactic, right? Uh, is there something else that is happening that we need to make visible? And so I use this notion of the making of informal jurisdiction. Now, I use the term jurisdictions freely. I'm not a lawyer, so it's a bit daunting to trot out jurisdiction. But jurisdiction, I've understood, is a rather flexible term, anyhow. So, so there are several cases. My global cities, in a way, the global cities that I sort of discovered, if you want, that notion of global cities. Uh, they are a kind of informal jurisdiction. It's partial, you know, it's not a territorial, it's partly functional, it's sort of complex. Export processing zones. They're not so informal, but they, they, the, the operational space that they are goes way beyond the formal letter, you know. The Somali pirates, you know, they have really kind of informal jurisdiction. They have certain rules, you know, certain people don't vote. Governments tell others, don't you go there, etc., with your sailing boat. Now, I just want to look quickly at this land thing. I should say, as a social scientist, I, you know, the, the, buying, the buying of land by foreign actors is, is an old story, very old story. It's always there, it grows, it goes down, etc. I am interested when I detect a sudden change in the curve. That puts me on notice. The sudden change in the curve in this case happened in 206. 206, we now know from Freedom of Information Act that has produced uh, uh, information about some of the debates that central banks were having, that by 206, the big banks knew that serious trouble was coming. They did not tell their clients, they did not tell others, but they knew. There were, this is at least in the case of the United States, but, it, but evidently it's also in others. And, and so in 206, this land buying goes up. So here's, here are the, I have access to 93 contracts. By the way, there are many, many more than that. And I'm interested in understanding the making of a possibility. 
In many ways, the interstate system is such that it is not so easy for a government to buy land in a foreign country. And mostly it's long-term leases, in fact. But in fact, there are some cases like buying, you know, when Goldman Sachs buys land in, uh, in Ukraine, and, and all kinds of firms buying land also in, in Russia. You know, it's sort of a challenge to execute those. And so they go through the most incredible complexities. Again, I'm interested in how we develop incredibly complex instruments, the talented classes again, in order to generate what are ultimately elementary brutalities. You see, this is, so the subprime mortgage is one example. This is, in a way, another example. And the curve goes up. We can establish that 70 million have been bought in a way that we know the buyer and the seller. When we just look at the sellers, we can find the buyers in, in the you know in, in whatever the arrangements of the data that we're looking at. This is, by the way, it's not just me. It, these are enormous numbers of institutions all over that are gathering the data. It's very difficult to gather this data. And but what you, when we just look at sellers, it's 220 million hectares that have been sold. Now, we know from other data, am I supposed to finish? Yes. We know from other data that um, I can't, ah, conclusion. Okay, that conclusion means two minutes more. So we know from other data that, that uh, hedge funds have moved in big time into buying land. And we know, just from official data, that financial firms, well, financial firms have to, you know, they are under some level of regulation. <laughs> Hedge funds, hey, it's almost zero. So, of course, the reason they buy land is not, it's not because, you know, they want to use it, whatever, agriculturally. So this question of buying land, what are we looking at there? And I want to just uh, give a one little very concrete example, but again, it's the minority situation that still is. So when China buys 2.8 million hectares in a in Congo and 208 million in Zambia to do, and this is very specific because they do other all other things as well. But to do uh, to do a plantation, what does it mean to make a plantation? It evicts floras, faunas, villages, smallholder agriculture districts, small uh, rural manufacturing districts, all the activities, the articulators that sort of, if you want, constitute that piece of land as territory of Zambia, if you want, you know, some notion of national territory. It's all erased. It's a kind of total erasure. And so I, I see that as one instance, there are others that I use, uh, of a kind of the making of an informal jurisdiction. We don't know exactly what that is. Now again, I'm giving an extreme interpretation in a heuristic mode, right, to see, well, what are we talking about? Now that for me is, a, these are examples of a global, being made inside national sovereign territory. And I want to conclude by, by saying that while commodification is a good explanation, I'm trying to understand this question of informal jurisdictions by looking at sort of emergent assemblages of territory, authority, and rights, which can be the, by, made by global finance, made by these global firms that I was talking about, or made actually as structural holes, if you want, in the tissue of national sovereign territory. And to me, all of these uh, have a quite interesting interaction between global actors like firms, private actors, etc. This world of private actors and private orderings, if you want, and the state. And so I don't know how that really fits, you know, Gunter, with, with societal constitution, I didn't use the word once, but there is something happening that, pardon? That's <laughs> there is something happening that is happening inside the national, either via the implementation of norms, as with high finance that I described, or direct, you know, buying of huge amounts of land, where the whole question of the jurisdictional authority becomes a bit vague. Um, that I think we need to be needs to be part of the landscape that we're trying uh, to describe. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Quite different perspective. Yeah. Than, uh, the and because of that, I think uh, the question was uh, would like to be first. Yeah, 
Yeah, thank you. I was very much intrigued how you conceptualize this interrelation between the self-constituting of global conditions, the making of subjects on the one side, and then the role of law. And, and you make a very important distinction between two cases. In one case, we can still speak of constitutionalization, namely when there is a kind of match between the two and a new constitutional order has emerged, like in the case of the nation state, or perhaps you also could speak of the ICANN constitutions, where, in a sense, legal rules are used to support an emerging self constituted global structure, but which lead to this kind of structural coupling or whatever you want to tell it, but to name it. But you are more interested in, so let's say, the kind of perverse use of the law. Right, where you have this in invasion metaphor. And I, I just would like to ask, can we, can we translate the invasion into more, you know, let's say, theoretical terms? I give you a, a, three alternatives. Could it be that it has to do with a contradiction between the different logics involved? Mm -hmm. uh, so that the law applied uh, obeys a different logic, be it the logic of the law itself, or let's say of, of politics or something, something else, as opposed to the self-constituted subject. Secondly, has it to do with the non-synchronicity we were talking about today, uh, that you get into this kind of mismatch? And third, right. could it be that the subject, the created subject, is not justiciable? Huh? So, if I take your three cases, uh, the global firm, the, the NGO with a local character, and then the finance with this invading character. I would argue the first two cases are still examples of constitutionalization in the sense that the law then creates a kind of, of coupling with the process. So the global firm, although you said, ah, here we have this strange use of the different national laws, the thing is that... That's strange, that's strange. Oh. I, I want to emphasize that, that that's interesting to ah. me. Oh, very good. The so particularities we, yeah. Yeah, can right. lose a standardized process. Okay, so I don't want to make contrast yeah. here, but, but it still is. I mean, it's, it's very strange that there are these those different national laws, and nevertheless, a kind of new entity as a yes. unitas multiplex is emerging on the basis of those diversities, and which has as a, as a consequence the development of new legal concepts, new legal structures, namely what we could call a polycorporate legal actor, which doesn't act as a unity, but which acts in its, its different nodes as a le new legal constitutional concept. And it would be, the constitutionalization would be a strange combination of private ordering and, and the national state law. First case. Second case, NGOs uh, with this local character. There, I would say, it, it could be a in emerging constitutionalization, but the legal forms is still unsure. And then the third case is probably the dramatic case, where you, you have this, this in, invasion, and here I would wonder if my three uh, suggestions for interpretation, yeah. different logics, dissynchronicity, or the subject is not just this, but not helpful, or if you have a fourth one. I have a fourth one. Okay. Can I show it? <laughs> oh no. Oh yeah, the new, I mean, are you serious? I should first answer your question, because I have, what I wanted to add is this new surveillance space, which has its own characteristics. It's definitely transnational, but totally focused on locals in Germany, in the UK, in the United States. Those are different things I'm studying, there are others. But I want to answer your very interesting comments, and then I will show this, this last case. So, you know, I think a first, difference is the starting point. See, for me, I, what I'm trying to argue is that we still construct as the national, is in many cases denationalized. <coughs> denationalized, not in the sense that the Brits use it as privatized, yeah? but I mean that it is no longer constituted the, uh, the, as the national that was historically sort of recognized as national in this sort of current 20th century area. So that is the starting point, you know, that, that a lot of what presents itself as national in the historic sense of the modern state is not national. Now, I have been, learned a lot from uh, your work on the executive branch of government, you know, and I, I then simplify, of course, what he has said. So I take it a, a bit further in the name of uh, producing clarity, if you want. And I argue that at the limit, 
the executive branch of government, whether it's prime ministerial or, or presidential, has one foot in the last 20 years, one foot firmly planned in global circuits. That is how it functions. The legislature, on the other hand, stays rather parochial. The judiciary can vary a bit, but that mostly is also. So I see also a structural formation. So the first point for us, in a way, to have a long discussion over a lot of wine and food, you know, so that we don't need to stick to our strong position, is that there is an in-between zone that I see in formation, and the state itself has contributed. But and then again, comes this whole notion of all these different. And, and, um, and, and also, for me, the executive branch of government gains power with globalization, not the <coughs> state. Because when WTO, IMF, and all these other regulatory agencies try to persuade a country to, you know, the 90s being the high point of this, the 1990s, they, they, uh, they deal with the executive branch of government. So the more powerful they were, the more powerful the executive branch also became. So what I am interested in is that it's the equivalent of the regulatory fracture. You know, it is neither national nor global. And that is why I would say in my research, I have argued that, that the, the duality, global, national, does not help us to understand what is happening now or where we are at. Maybe at the beginning it helped. And so I, I argued that I have to stand back uh, from those two categories and find some more foundational categories that are not so embedded in this particular formation. And so I chose territory authority and rights, which I see as collectively produced. They're complex, they have embedded histories of power and of empowerment, etc., etc. And, um, and hence my project to liberate you know, the category of territory. So I think that what, what really happens here is that I see a lot of what you see, but then I'm also digging there inside the national and coming up with items. And so for me, the, an interest in this whole workshop is how would we theorize that in-between zone huh? uh, that, that takes many different forms. But I wanted to show one, so this new surveillance space, you know what we're talking about, right? This is not, this is not anti-terrorism, but it's, it's really, it's, it comes it's in the last 10 years and many countries are part of it. It's by necessity transnational, but also by necessity focused in each country on its own, whoever is in the country. And so this has grown, I'm, I'm just giving you the data for the United States. This has grown enormously. And we now have uh, uh, almost a million people with top clearance. And within that is a very significant number of private firms. Now here the story gets interesting. These private firms hire talent. It term you have understood that I hate that term, but you know it's shorthand for all kinds of things. And a lot of that talent, you know, hey, we're talking mathematicians, we're talking technologists, they come from, you know, you don't have to be a citizen. And these private firms, anyhow, they have ambiguous nationalities, if you want. So this is another ironic thing, that here is the state developing a surveillance apparatus, which is quite denationalized internally. Again, this is the executive branch of government producing this. It's not, does not come from the legislature, though. They may have approved something. Now, here is the best we know, and this was produced by, by a whole bunch of experts, and etc. This is what we know. Almost 10,000 actual buildings. The last one was one big one built in Utah, Utah, whatever that is pronounced, Utah, that they just finished uh, building. And um, what we don't know is what we don't know. You know, as Ramsell would put it? In other words, we don't know how many more there are, but we know that these are there. Now, these are only semi secret, you know, because, hey, they are big physical structures. It's not like they. In Washington, it's a huge uh, new, new sort of built-up area. And so to me, this is very interesting. And, and so I have a little, um, this phrase that I have up there, you know, are we the citizens, the new colonials? This is, has to be transnational, because otherwise, it's really pointless. So it, we're, states are collaborating with each other. The United States has passed, you maybe know more about this, has passed recently a kind of uh, agreement with all the countries that it deals with in terms of 
uh, paying attention to certain types of surveillance capabilities inside the country. It's, it's quite interesting what is happening, I would say. that. And, uh, um, you know, whoever is in the country, now here is here's the, here's the mechanism. The mechanism is for our security, this surveillance space exists. For our security, they have to survey us all. For our security, we are all suspects. Trump in some of these new that some of you know more about than I do, uh, these new uh, you know like unlawful detention, pre-trial solitary confinement, the security letter, national security letter. I mean, Germany has some of that too. The UK does too. So this is a very interesting zone. How this fits into this notion that the national is national, I don't know. But it's time to end. I know. We yeah we have to. Uh, we have got 10 extra minutes from the organization. Oh my God, you're so, so generous. Yeah. So, so let me collect yeah. questions then. Right. Yes. Yes, yeah. you Thank you very much uh, for a very stimulating paper. I, um, I wouldn't wish to particularly take issue with any of the uh, contemporary diagnoses and analyses. But I would have a question about the historical foundations and the historical trajectory of the UAR. The, the trajectory of the, the, the historical foundations and the historical trajectory of, of, of nationalization and social formation of the UAR. I'd like to ask a question, a very simple question, particularly as you talk about structural holes within uh, existing national domains. When, when did societies, I mean, in this uniform and rather generalized way, um, that you suggest. When did societies actually become nationalized? Yeah, well, uh, this is a question that, I, it, it seems to me that we, we tend to, we operate with an almost ontological category of yes. uh, territorial uh, homology between national statehood and, 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 and territory. And I would suggest this actually never existed. What we, do, what we encounter in contemporary society is an overlayering of different levels of structural holes, if you like, or structural gaps within the national domain. Some of them are pre-national nature and some of them are post-national nature. But national, the, the, the nation state or the unity of territory and nationhood in the way that you suggest, I think, I, I would say quite simply, this never existed, it never occurred as well, a historical I, phenomenon. I, I mean, I, I agree with the foundational issue, but there was a project, a very strong project, the 20th century represents a project. It was never completed. Never, of course not. It's impossible because these, 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 like I said, land, land buying by foreign actors has been happening for centuries. Like where we call it strictly. So I don't disagree with that. But the point is that there is a state project to nationalize identity. To whether it ever, I you should see my book. I absolutely don't agree. I try to po point out the holes that exist. But there is a the, I, what I do see, and there maybe we do disagree. I see that this project. Changes. It changes in the 1980s, and you see it most clearly in certain aspects, you know, and, and those are the ones that I'm looking at, so I'm looking at extreme cases. But I think the, the Keynesian period was a different political economy from the current one. <coughs> you know, and if you look at finance, it was different. There was, you know, each country replicated a certain type of international funding. It, it only existed in a, in a handful of, in a handful of well, I know, societies. But, yeah, but that's the point. And, and today it spreads and it creates another space. But you know, this is always a discussion. I, as I said at the beginning, I said that, I tried to say that, I'm interested in the extreme situation in order to understand a larger case. But, you know, we can always say, that is why when, when I talk about land graphs, people always say, well, it's land commodification. Yes, it is. Is there something else happening? That is my interest here, too. So I don't disagree, you know, with what you're saying, but I'm interested in understanding in the shadow of this self-evident, powerful explanation that, you know, a lot of this has existed for a very long time. Is there something else? That is, that is what I'm doing, you know, so, yes. Take one last short question. Two examples, so you don't even have to respond. But I just wanted to give you okay. two examples that would uh, that you could add to 
uh, a couple of the places where you're just, uh, uh, in your analysis. Uh, one is you were talking about areas of new borders or new borderings. And one I thought actually would be useful for you because it's counterintuitive um, is the uh, internet itself. Um, so the internet is often thought of as borderless, or we sometimes think of it in terms of state actors like China trying to reimpose kind of borders through censorship. But what we don't often talk about is um, private actors like internet service providers, search engines, um, the companies that own the, um, the software for shared multi-user domains, uh, Facebook and so forth, um, creating technologically protected and managed borders of what you can do and what you can't do, which are not in law, they're in technology. Um, and so that I thought that would be a good example yes. for you. And, the, and then an example of a new jurisdiction, um, since you're talking about finance, would be to specifically talk about the trade finance system. The international trade finance system is governed by rules that are created by a small cadre of bankers in a bar in Basel, Switzerland, every year or every two years. And they actually meet, and there's some literature on this, to develop the, the rules that govern all of international trade finance. And there's not a state or a WTO actor to be found. Yeah, no, these are great, great examples. Thank you very much. Yeah.